This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to Asia Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong. Second only to um, drug trafficking, human trafficking is the most profitable transnational crime. Out of the 21 million that are trafficked globally, 26% of those are children. We have with us today in the studio Mr. Valjo Solera, a human trafficking survivor, to share his story with us. Welcome to the show, Mr. Ba Mr. Would you like me to call you Mr. Valjo or Mr. Valger. Solera? Yeah, it's okay, Valjo. All right, welcome to the show, Valjo. Thank you, Lily. All, right. really. All right, now when did you first arrive in the United States? In 2013, in August 2013. Okay, and you are a national of Brazil. Yeah, I'm from original from Brazil in Sao Paulo. Okay, and what made you come to Hawaii? Well, I'm biologist. I studied uh, agriculture biology, and um, in Brazil we have uh, taught if it, here here in the United States is everything first word. So it's very good for us come here and study and see how the technology and the things work here, even the farm. Mm -hmm. So an, an opportunity came about for you to come to the United States? Yeah, I come for internship for, I, um, I was uh, work, uh, working, in, I was thinking I would come to work with, in an organic farm because that's my field work. So yeah, I come in 2013 for working a farm. Uh, for my biology degree will be my, my internship for my fin finish my degree. Okay, and is this internship organized by your university or was it an outside contractor? I was outside contractor, but they was very involved. They was very, my, actually my, my university recommend me to go with this, mm -hmm. this program, with this company. Okay, and from the time that you sign up to the time you actually got on a plane, how long was the process? Uh, it was months of, of process. Uh, I was feeling confident because my university helped me with this, all this uh, organization for I come. Uh, and I was excited to come. It was my first time in the United States. And it was like, I would say, four or five months. Yeah, preparation. What, are, what were the things that you had to do to qualify? Were there any qualifications or prerequisites? Yeah, I needed to do one interview by via Skype. And uh, in this interview, they asked me a, uh, a lot about my background. Who, and who is interviewing you? Uh, the company who brought me to, to brought, uh, who brought me to here. And they're based in the United States. Yeah, they based okay. me, they based here. He, so the it's guy not is the actual employer that you were going to. Uh, no, the the, his, the guy is Brazilian, mm -hmm. they, but he works here. He works for this company, mm -hmm. and uh, he's vice president of this company. And I need to be approved for him from him. To, to be able to come here. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, one interview for uh, around 30 minutes interview, and they asked me a lot about my, my background and my family and my financial situation. And yeah, um, and I, I got approved after this interview. So it sounded very legitimate. No, it's not. No. Wasn't uh, now I know, yeah, but uh, before I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, so, so back then, it, it sounded legitimate to you back then. Yeah, was right. was legitimate. Were there anything you have to do? Did you have to pay a fee or? I have to pay a lot of fees. Um, like uh, uh, my money is different than here. Like uh, dollars are expensive in my country, and I I need to pay some fees in dollar. And my my dad helped me to pay that. So, and I need uh, one. Uh, somebody to guarantee I will pay when I uh, when I come How much did you here. have to pay? Around around ten thousand dollars. U.S. dollars. Yeah, U.S. Okay. dollars. Right. Yeah. And that money is to them. Do you get to get it back, or is it a deposit? No, it wasn't a deposit. Uh, I I paid them like. Uh, uh, it was weird because I pay many fees. I, I didn't pay all together, mm -hmm. so that's part of the. Now I know it's part of the crime, but. Uh, I paid like uh, first f f f uh, five hundred dollars and five hundred more dollars, and for this person, for the other person. So, yeah, uh, wasn't just for one one situation. I paid like uh, in 
parts. So there were a series of payments that you have to make, but you felt pretty assured because your university helped to organize. Yeah, I, I, I was feeling confident because my university uh, was recommending and I, my teachers uh, liked the program and uh, I was feeling confident. And they have sent students prior to you? Yeah, uh, other students come with me from the same university. And, so, and, so, yeah. and you mentioned your dad helped you to pay the fee, so I imagine your family, they were very excited too. And your yeah, and uh, the frustration is part of the, the thing. Uh, if it was just the money, the money in some point you can pay, in, but uh, the frustration is, I think, is bigger than the money. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you got on a plane, you arrived in the United States. Was Honolulu your first stop? Where did you? No, I went to Maui, I, in Maui, in Haiku. Okay. I was working on, farm, on tomato farms in Haiku. Okay. And me and other three Asians workers. Where were they from? From Cambodia, Vietnam, and China. Okay. Yeah. And so you arrived. Um, tell us, how was your first day on the farm like? Well, I was with jet lag, so I was very sleepy. I was very tired Did from the flight. Did it give you a couple of days to rest up, or you no, had to go no, walk I, right I, away? No, I went uh, straight to the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did the farm look to you when you first arrived? I mean, was there anything peculiar about it? Um, besides the three other interns, what other people were there? Um, actually, it was just the owner of the farm and the other interns. That was uh, this this guy, this owner this, from this farm. He used the, this program with he did, uh, how's the labor job in his in his farm. So it wasn't internship at all. It was just a labor job, and I I could I I didn't come for work here. I come for internship, mm -hmm. and wasn't nothing didactic, and was like. A, that wasn't the internship at all. Okay, so you were supposed to come here to learn, but you ended up doing hard labor on the day. How, yeah. how many hours do you work a day? did you work a day on the farm? Actually, I was a uh, 24 hours employee because everything he needs, he lock in my, knock in my door and ask me to do. So I work, i supposed to start work seven and finish six, but I work nights and if he, buy something new for the farm, he needs somebody to take from the truck, it was me. If he need uh, do something for the dogs, it was me. If he need to do fancy, fence, well, well, I do everything, a construction a job on the farm, uh, well, everything was us, the, the interns. So you run the errands, you're a personal assistant, you do construction, yeah. you do the labor on the farm, okay. All right, um, were, you, were you guys getting paid on the farm? Yeah, we get paid uh, $1.20 per hour. Was that the amount that was promised you before you came? No, it wasn't the amount. Uh, we couldn't understand uh, because uh, I, I'm supposed to receive $400 per month. And for me, in Brazil, $400 is a lot. Mm -hmm. But here in Hawaii, it's not, a, it's not enough to pay your food your uh, supplies and your uh, transportation, well, it uh, wasn't enough at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of conditions did you work under? I mean, since you were farming, were you, did you have to use any pesticides, or what kind of protection gear did they provide? Um, any protection gear, we need to spray uh, pesticides, and hormones was uh, inside, was a greenhouse, so, we, sh we we need to spray everything inside. What, With um, protection or no protection? Any protection. No any protection. protection. I ask you, I'm allergic to uh, some things. And plus, the things we spray doesn't have a label because he take off the label. Oh, so you don't even so know what I don't you're I don't know if it's to. corrosive. I don't know if I'm allergic to it. I, I, I was very bad. And one plus in this whole this situation was the the character of the farmer. He was very, um, he wasn't never polite. He was very aggressive always. So we was always afraid to ask something. We was always afraid to, to tell some issue. So he, he have zero communication. So that was the part. The so what do you do hard. when you guys try to bring up an issue to him? What was, did or he, he just not respond or what? Yeah, he just ignored it or he just, uh, I start start to say, oh, you, you're here for work and uh, don't come with stupid questions and 
He was very aggressive, very not polite person. Okay, was he the only person there? Besides yeah, the it was the unit the communication. Yeah, because we're not supposed to go out the farm. Right. We, wait, where did you guys yeah. sleep on the farm? Uh, we have a house separate. Um, was one with very small rooms, and uh, all the interns stay in this house. Mm -hmm. And what did they feed you guys with? I'm. I'm. I was responsible for my food. So I need buy and cook my own food. But he did provide a kitchen facility. Now, in the event that um, you know one of you guys falls sick, does he provide a doctor medications? Uh, happens. Uh, I have uh, uh, on the, when I was on the farm. I have a tooth pamph. I was with me, my wisdom tooth, mm -hmm. and he. I asked to him to take. Me. I I supposed to have insurance. Uh, health insurance before I come here, but I never use, and I know we didn't have it all. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked him to take me to the dentist because I was with painful because my wind wisdom tooth, mm -hmm. and he he said just take something for the pain, and go back to work. Did he impose any restrictions on use of the bathroom or when you could go to sleep? Um, did he allow you guys to leave the property? No, we were not not supposed to go out anytime. Just Sundays. Uh, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. But the farm, I don't know if you know Maui, the farm is oh, it's far away from the city, so we don't have car, we don't have transportation. So, so there's really nowhere to go to. Yeah, nowhere to go to. And okay. he decided this time we should go to the grocery store to buy food. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't have any time for ourselves. And uh, yeah, we, we cannot go he was counting the minutes for I go to the bathroom. And he was, was counting the minutes, so he yeah. was using the bathroom. Yeah, and I, I not, I'm not supposed to eat. Uh, I, ju I just have a lunch time, mm -hmm. 30 minutes, and that's it. So and, he yeah. took you guys to the grocery store to get your food, is that right? Yes, okay. and he go together with us, and he stay all the time with us. Yeah. Now, that sounds like a horrible you know, living condition. Have you contemplated escaping you know, when you're at a grocery store? Have you contemplated going to an outside source or pick up your phone and call somebody? Did you tell your family? Did you call the school? Actually, I have uh, I have uh, access to cell phone and computer, um, but I I in this case of human trafficking, it, they use a lot of coercion. So I wasn't able to tell everybody how in 2013 and the, you you was a victim of this and uh, well. Uh, we you don't we don't feel comfortable to tell about the situation. So you didn't tell your family at all. Uh, I did after I actually I when you asked me if I was thinking to about to leave the farm or mm -hmm. I did actually. Did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I did after four months in this situation. Uh -huh. I uh, I just take my I, he was very upset one day and he kicked us out the farm and I, I don't think twice and I just left. Mm. And prior to departure, did you inform your family or any authorities? Yes, I did. I called the cops one day. They went to the farm and they say we, they, we cannot do nothing. Just go back to your country. But I don't have my tickets to go back to my country. The company hold my tickets and I actually lost that ticket. What about your passport? Did they take your passport too? No, didn't, they didn't take my passport. I, okay. I keep my, all my IDs. But uh, without ticket, without know the language, without no, no, I didn't have any friends. I didn't have opportunity to make friends. Right. I didn't have, uh, well, I, don't, I didn't speak English at all that time. I see. So I wasn't able to to, to ask see. for help, so. Well, well thank you so much, Fauci. We're gonna take a little break here, and then when we come back, we're gonna talk about how you transition from a human trafficking victim into a refugee. Okay. All right. Thank this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm a firefighter. A teacher. I'm a farmer. I'm a barber. A waitress. A mom. We're all part of your community. Every day we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when you experience a moment of uncertainty, something or someone's behavior that doesn't seem quite right. These are the moments to take a pause. 
Because if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not. It's not about paranoia. Or being afraid. It's about standing up and protecting our communities. One detail at a time. Because a lot of little details can become a pattern. We. 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 We trust our instincts. Just like you should. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your everyday. So protect your everyday. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lola Ong. We have with us today Mr. Val Josolera to share with us a story on his struggles as a human trafficking victim and then his journey as a human trafficking survivor. So to continue our story, Voucher, um, so you were kicked out of the farm. What happened next? Yeah, next I tried uh, looking for help and I, I called many lawyers and, well, I didn't actually. I asked for, I just met one friend, one Brazilian uh, person. I didn't, wasn't my friend, was just somebody I just, have met <laughs> and I ask if they can translate my translate my with the cops or help me at some point and finally I got to uh, one association one local uh, association um, and they they helped me they helped me a lot mm -hmm. and I was able to get a lawyer and the homeland security decided my my case was uh, human trafficking so and after that, they give me a T visa, mm -hmm. and I'm still under the T visa. Mm -hmm. And then you will reclassify as a refugee afterwards. Yes, right? yes. In fact, in 2015 and 2016, as you had told me earlier, um, you were the Hawaii representative to the Refugee Congress. Uh, when was the first Congress in 2015? Um, no, 2016. Yes. Where did that take place? Uh, I was in Washington D.C. Uh, we was able to to go to the Congress and talk with our representatives was a very wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And who were present besides yourself? Who else were there? Other refugees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this organization shows one refugee in each state. Each one of the 50 states has one representative. So 50 representatives? Yeah, 50 from the 50 states. So okay. uh, I was representing Hawaii mm -hmm. in 2016, and they mm -hmm. chose me again for this year in 2017. Mm -hmm. And what did you guys do when you when you got there? What did you do? Uh, we advocate for refugees' rights and for immigrant rights. So it uh, was a wonderful experience because I was able to tell my history, and with my history, help other people in the same situation. So everybody was sharing stories? Yes, we have a lot of histories there. Did you hear similar stories, or were they very unique in their own different ways? Yeah, uh, we have people there from from yeah from Iraqi, Afghanistan, um, Syria, uh, some parts of uh, Africa. We have from Asia, from uh, the countries Cambodia, uh, China. We have many people. Mm -hmm. many refugees from this country. Would you mind sharing one or two stories? Um, I just want to hear perhaps another. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I met people from diff 20 different countries, and was uh, this guy from Afghanistan. He was the guy from the translator for the military, and he got uh, the Taliban was uh, retaliating him. He they try kill him and his family. So the military guy, guys take him to the base and send him straight to him and his family, straight to the United States to ask for asylum. Because if they stay there, they will get murdered for sure. So now they are here for like a refugees. Have some people who live years and years in uh, refugee camps, like in, um, um, in Cambodia and in, they come here. They are. It's he's the delegate from North Carolina now, and many his strong histories. Mm -hmm. Many stronger histories. Right. So refugee is typically defined somebody that has to flee the country due to war, poverty, persecution based on race, religion, and so on and so forth. How did you, as a human trafficking victim, become classified as a refugee? Was it because you couldn't go back to your country? What would happen if you had gone back to your country? Well, uh, when we talk about refugees, we ha we talk about people who ask asylum, uh, people who uh, cannot go back to the country anymore, 
for some reason, war or uh, political issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we was. Uh, if I go back to my country, I have my career damaged because of this situation. My uh, academic life and my professional life it's totally uh, destroyed because what happened. And uh, this organization, they have a lot of power in Brazil because, unfortunately, in Brazil, it, the justice is very slow and... Uh, so we're not just talking about one university that's the culprit. We're talking about a whole network of organization working in collusion. Yeah, they was working together. It's a lot of money involved. If they send, you can imagine, they send a lot of people to here every year. So, uh, and they probably don't want to lose this opportunity to make money. So it's many people involved in, unfortunately, my university still is involved with this. And I can have serious retaliations if I go back to my country. So if you had gone back, you would not be able to resume your studies. You probably couldn't find work because they're all connected. And there's a chance that they might be harmed. Did you receive any threats at all? Yeah, I, my family in Brazil now, they, uh, when I just report, they received some from some guys from this company went to my my parents' house and they was telling bad things about me and say everything what happens here was my fault was because I'm a bad guy that's why I report and so they point a finger back at you yes yes and that uh, and wasn't true but uh, now if I go back to Brazil I'm sure I will have a lot hard time there. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think of refugee, we really think about people that, you know, are fleeing war, poverty, or a harsh political climate. So your story is very unique, and I think it helps us to, you know, um, get over the misconception that there's only one category of refugee, because refugees can cut across, you know, nations, races, mm -hmm. gender, age, and even culture. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, currently in America, there is a pretty strong anti-immigration movement going on um, due to the new administration. What do you feel about that? Well, um, it's a lot of feelings, actually. Um, I can resume this and say we are hoping for the best and prepared for the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we a lot going on. We actually don't know yet what we will we're facing, so yeah, we we're ready for our fight for our, our rights and mm -hmm. and talk about what we are really are. And uh, United States is one country building with uh, immigrant, so uh, that's uh, that's. That's it, and we need to fight for this mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you get a little disillusion afterwards, yeah, because yeah. it is the world leader on a geopolitical state. Yeah. So if the world leader is you know, having its um, refugees by half from 110,000 to 45,000 and cutting the budgets, and all these refugees, they are overburdening, overburdening countries like Bangladesh and Turkey, um, what kind of message are we as the world leader sending to other countries when we're doing that? Yeah, uh, especially in families who already have members here, and they separate the families because the, the other members, the families cannot come here to United States with the new, this new, and the, the, all the bans and the, the uh, well, it is a, will be a mess because some people wait for years and years in a refugee camp, and they, it's already very hard, and now it will be way worse because uh, they make a lot more difficult to get here. Mm -hmm. You need to prove many other things and, well, uh, I hope we, we have some uh, mercy in this next, uh, mm -hmm. next well, year. Well, I want to share a high-profile case that took place in Hawaii a couple of years ago. Um, there was a farm um, right here in Kapolei in Honolulu, and they had brought in 44 Thai workers. And um, the Thai workers were accusing the owners of underpaying them, allowing them to live in substandard housing, and threatening to take away their work visa if they comp don't comply with whatever they wanted. And um, the case went on for two years. Um, the lead prosecutor was removed halfway through the case. Um, initially, the defendants pled guilty, and then they took, took back their plea. 
Um, in the end, the case was dismissed in the absence of the jury and was dismissed with prejudice, meaning that um, the, per the, the government can no longer refile the case. So as a human trafficking victim, when you hear about you know, cases like this, how does that make you feel? How do you think it would make those that are still struggling to get out, would they be more hesitant about coming forward? Well, for, uh, it is, when you talk about uh, uh, human trafficking, it is very hard to prove because it's everything covered. It's a it's a system. It's a uh, it's a crime. So it is doesn't have proofs available. So I feel very sad about this situation, about this case in particular, because I, I feel the same in my country. I still cannot prove I, I was victim of this. So um, and we hope in this country, United States, where we have more justice, we hope it's different. And I hope, I really hope in this case, then on the final they find, uh, for in, because in my eyes, in my view, it's a, a case of human trafficking for sure. So the burden of proof is very heavy. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you had to overcome some struggles to come out. I'm sure there's some stigma attached to it for you to have to come out to, you know, speak out. How did you overcome those struggles to come forward and share your story? Yeah, it's very hard. Uh, we we dealing with a lot of frustration because uh, we, we was always uh, I was expecting come back to my country and um, and do what I come to do here. I come to learn something to bring to my to take to my country and uh, this new technology. And well, I was feeling I was feeling very very disappointed with this this whole situation. And I, we find energy in this, in this, this frustration. We find energy to fight about. We, we I don't have nothing to do uh, because if I can go back on the time, I will show it's never come to United States and never pass mm -hmm. for everything I pass. So, uh, I, but I cannot do this. Right. So I will. I uh, show sure his fight for the rights. Well, thank you so much, Voucher. Uh, we're coming to the end of the show. I just want to quick, very quickly share with the audience a hotline for human trafficking. So if you were to suspect any human trafficking activities, please call this number. Thank you so much, Lily. Yeah. Oh, there it is. OK. All right. And uh, Voucher, if you could say one sentence to the refugee or human trafficking out there, what would be the one message you want to pass over to them? Those who have not come forward, what would be that one message to say to them? Well, be strong, be together, and be hopeful for the next years. We, we're still fighting. And nobody's alone in this fight. Okay. Thank you so much, Voucher. And I just want to let you know that those dreams that you hoped you came with initially, they're still alive, you can still go for them. And it's really people like you who come forward to share your story, to testify as witnesses that will bring about successful human trafficking prosecutions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks much. for watching.